Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this webinar, which is being hosted by AHDB Beef and Lamb. My name is Chloe McKee, and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Officer for Beef and Lamb at AHDB. I'm delighted to bring you tonight's webinar on top tips for buying and looking after your rams. Our presenters this evening are Emma Steele, Signet Breeding Specialist, and Dr. Fiona Lovett from Flock Health Limited. So the plan of action is that Emma will run through a 15-minute presentation, and then we'll hand over to Fiona for a further 15 minutes. You will all stay muted throughout the webinar, but if anyone would like to ask a question, then please type your question into the box on the side of your screens. If you can't see this box, you may need to click the orange arrow to open this up. I will then ask Emma and Fiona your questions at the end of the presentation. So hopefully there won't be any technical difficulties, but please bear with us if there are any. So I'll now hand over to Emma. So hi everyone, um, I'm Emma and I work for Signet Breeding Services at AHDB and we provide the genetic evaluations um, for the majority of sheep breeds and some of the numerically smaller beef breeds in the UK and I'm just going to take you through some of the things to look for um, if you're thinking of buying a recorded ram this season. So we're looking at for EBVs and indexes. So I'm hoping people have heard, have heard of these before, but I'm just gonna run through the basics of them quickly first. So what are EBVs and indexes in the, um, in the simplest form? So we compare, uh, we combine parentage and performance data to get the best estimation of genetic merit. And then an EBV is the genetic merit um, of an animal for an individual trait. So that could be growth weight to eight weeks, muscle depth across the loin, fat depth across the loin, anything like that. The EBV is the individual number for that trait, for that element of the animal. What we then do is we put certain EBVs together, um, those of commercial importance, and we combine them to make it a bit easier to get a ram um, or a or a breeding animal that's going to do the best job for you and the index is a measure of its overall performance um, and how its progeny can be expected to perform so for the terminal index that would be that they're fast growing we've got to get the lambs um, off farm as quick as possible they've got to be well muscled we want to be hitting those good confirmation grades and they've got to have optimum finish as well so if you're looking for that, you'd be looking at the terminal index. We also have a maternal index, and that would be for anybody looking to buy um, rams because they want to breed their own female replacements, um, and they're really after breeding a productive female. So what data do we collect? What information goes into these evaluations? So first we take the pedigree information, so who mum and dad are, um, and we basically make one massive family tree. And then we also take detailed lambing records. So that would be as much as any fostering information. So we want to know who the genetic dam of that lamb is, but we also want to know the dam that reared it. And on the same lines as that, we're looking at AI and ET information. We want to know about all that as well. We also collect information on birth weights and we also collect information on lambing ease scores. Um, so that data is all put into the evaluations. We take weight at important life stages. So this is both around eight weeks of age and that goes into the eight week weight EBV. And again, at scanning, which is typically around 40 kilos. At scanning, we take ultrasound uh, scanning information. So that's basically the depth of the eye muscle in your lamb chop. We take a picture of that and we record the measurement at the deepest point of the muscle. And then we also take fat measurements across the top of the loin. We take mature size measurements for anybody that is looking at breeding female replacements. You want to make sure you're not just going to have massive inefficient use. So we do um, we do record mature size just to keep a handle on that. And breed specific traits as well. So terminal sires, a lot of those will go through the CT scanner. So that takes a whole body image of the animal compared to the ultrasound scanner, which is just looking at one point on the loin. Um, anybody keeping maternal animals, so the clins, for example, they look at um, FET counts and have collected FET counts. And we've got the Dorsets who have done some work in carcass grades as well. So there are a key, a key set of traits, but depending on the breed and the breed type, we also have extras in there as well. 
So how do we get from all this information that's being collected? So in the top left, you've got the, the, um, the lambs being weighed. In the middle, you've got the ultrasound scanner there. And on the right-hand side, you've got the CT scanner and the lamb going into there. How do we get from all that information to this chart here, which is essentially a basic form of EBVs that you'd be expecting to see at sales? Well, what we do is we take the pedigree data so who, mum, dad, auntie, uncle, any relative we know about, we take that information and we also take the trait phenotype. Phenotype is just a fancy word for a measurement. So any measurement is a phenotype, a weight is a phenotype. Um, if you wanted the colour of, uh, color of wool, anything like that is a phenotype. So we take that measurement and the pedigree data and we put it into a statistical model called BLUP with some geneticists up in Edinburgh. Now, that, um, that model, BLUP, that stands for Best Linear Unbiased Predictor, and it does what it says on the tin. So it's the best we have available to us. It works in a linear reward system. So generally, the better you are for something, the more points you get. It's unbiased, so it doesn't care who the breeder is, how much you paid for the ram, or which shows it's won this year. It will give you an unbiased um, opinion of that animal's genetic merit. And it is a prediction. So that prediction will change th throughout the animal's life. And as we, as we get more information um, on animals, as they go from being lambs through to shearlings, through to stock rams with progeny, for example, that prediction may change. Um, and what that model does is it takes out all the environmental influences on performance. So uh, feeding, management, health, it takes all those aspects out um, as farm effects and just leaves you with the genetic merit of that animal. And that is the EBV that we have. But we can create lots of different EBVs. So on this screen is nearly, it's not quite all of them, but it is nearly every EBV we can produce for an animal. So if I asked you to go away and make decisions on this, you wouldn't know where to start. It's really difficult. How do I weigh up one thing against another? How do I do the trade-off? So as I said before, we tried to make this a little bit easier and put it into an index. And an index is just a series of commercially important EBVs put together in a specific way to reach one goal. So if we're talking about the terminal sire index and what I said before, we're looking for lambs that grow quickly, have good confirmation and have the right levels of finish at around 40 kilos. So that's what goes into that index. But it's good to look at the indexes as the overview of the animal. So it's good um, to draw a line and avoid single trait selection. So you might go out to your sale and say, I want a ram that is in the top 10% based on index, on terminal index. So that's great, we've got that. But then after that, we need to look at the EBVs and the EBVs, the detail where we can tailor these individual rams to our farms. So I might go to my sale and say, I want a top 10% index, but I also want a really well muscled ram. Um, and that would be how you use both together. So just a quick bit about interpretation of the kind of thing you might see at a sale. So this is a sale chart, which I'm hoping people have seen um, either online, displayed, displayed above pens at your Kelso, your, Bill, your um, typical breed society ram sales. And what we have down the left side here is each of those EBVs that I was talking about. So each one is a trait. So eight week weight is a trait, mature size is a trait, litter size is a trait. So that tells you the EBVs down to where it says index at the bottom. And in this case, we're talking about the terminal index. We then have the EBV value next to it. Um, and that is the number, the figure associated to that animal for that individual trait. But just telling you that information by itself isn't very useful. Just saying an animal has an eight week weight of uh, EBV of 2.05, Without more information, it doesn't mean a great deal. So what we have are these charts that are to the right. The centre line is the average for the breed. And then a gen the general rule is to the right of the chart, uh, the right of the centre line, the better the animal is for that trait. To the left, 
the worse the animal is for that trait than average. So it just gives you a bit of context. So we can see that this eight week weight EBV of 2.05 is significantly better than the average just by looking at the chart. Where that differs slightly is for fat depth and we don't have better than and worse than average, we have fatter than and leaner than average. So that's where, um, where it is a little bit different. You'll also see EBVs accompanied by an accuracy value. Now, all that accuracy value is telling you is how much information we have on that animal. So it is essentially a measure of risk. So animals that have been measured themselves generally tend to be more accurate and picking them is a less risky option, if you like. Um, typically, the terminal traits, carcass traits, um, will tend to be higher accuracy than maternal traits, purely because they have a higher heritability associated with them. And we can collect that information much earlier on in the lamb's life as well. Um, if you are going out looking for unproven ram lambs or shearlings, you will have to accept a slightly lower accuracy value than you would with a proven stock ram. Another way of looking at the figures, if you don't have um, if you don't have the charts to hand and you're just presented with a series of numbers, is this is where you require the breed benchmark. So I've got a Suffolk animal here on my left and um, the Suffolk bench breed benchmark as well. Now, this benchmark looks really confusing and it is deliberately the most confusing one I've shown that you will ever see, just to say that you can use the um, simpler ones that are out there in sale catalogues. It's exactly the same principle, but I'll talk you through this one. So this animal um, in the top left has an eight week weight EBV of 3.76. So what doesn't mean anything to me? What I then do is use the breed benchmark to find the eight week weight, um, the eight week weight column in the estimated breeding values and go across until I find that it's actually in the top 5% for that trait because it is higher than the value in the top 5% box. The same applies for all the other traits. So for scan weight, we've got a scan weight EBV of 8.41. Where does that sit? Well, I find the scan weight uh, column, go across and I can see it's higher than 5.49, so it must be in the top 5%. And we can keep doing this throughout. Um, one that is slightly different in this example is its second index, the maternal index for that animal of 1.88. So I find my maternal index, which is on the bottom row on this table, and I go across and I can see that 1.88 sits between 165 and 196. So this animal, if I was trying to breed female replacements, would sit in the top 25%. Um, but just to say, this is probably the most complicated benchmark you will ever see. And those presented to you in sale catalogues or by breed societies will be much simpler, but the same principles apply. So coming back to EBVs and breeding indexes, and the index has been the overview and the EBV has been the detail. Um, just to show you a bit more what I mean by that, I've got three rams here, Fred, Bob and Ted, and each animal has a index of 220. So I'm going to say they're all in the top 20%, top 25% for their breed, whatever that may be. So they're all good animals, but each one of these rams is going to do a slightly different thing for my farm. So Fred here has the highest scan weight EBV. So his lambs are probably going to reach slaughter weights the quickest. So if I'm looking for growth, he might be the ram for me. But he also has the highest fat depth EBV. So if I have problems with lambs going over fat, maybe he's not the one for me. It's a trade off. Equally, I've got Ted at the bottom. He has the highest muscle depth EBV at 4.37. So if I'm looking for confirmation and I want to get my grades up, he would be the animal that I'd be looking at. And Bob in the middle is a complete all rounder. So he's doing each of those jobs well, but there are other animals that are doing the individual bits um, slightly better. So that's what I mean when I'm saying the, an index is an overview and the EBV is the detail. That's where we go in and match the RAM to my system. So what's in it for me as far as why should I buy, why should I buy recorded genetics? What's the point? 
Well, this is some of our information, some of our financials that have come back from the Ram Compare project. So we've got Duncan Nellis um, top left and Philip and Charlie Whitehouse on the right. So Duncan has he used um, three top one percent Rams and an average index Ram. His three top one percent Rams came back with an average carcass value of seventy four pounds ninety four compared to his average RAM with an average value of £70.29. So we're looking at nearly an extra £5 for lamb just, just for using better genetics. These lambs have all been reared and managed exactly the same way in the same year. And the same story for white houses at the bottom there. We've got nearly a £5 per lamb difference between his below average RAM and his top 1% RAM, with the top 1% RAM getting 92% of lambs in spec and away earlier than the below average RAM. So these are the kind of um, financial and performance differences you, you can start to see by getting these high merit, high genetic merit rams on farm and working for you. So how do I use this information? I think firstly, you need to um, focus on your commercial flock breeding objectives. You need to know what you want to do and you need to identify the EBVs that are then of importance to you. So before you go out looking for a ram and before you go out talking to people, identify what you want to improve on. Um, then get, get your breed benchmark before you go to your sale um, or that you go to buy your ram off farm, get your benchmark so that you're prepared. And this leaflet here has been produced with all the benchmarks in for the um, 12 breeds in the National Terminal Sire Evaluation. Source your EBVs. So every recorded animal, whether good or bad, can be found um, on the internet. So you can use either EBV search or quick search to find those animals. So there's no hiding. Once an animal is recorded, it is there. So you can go out and find that animal. Um, and at sale, breeders are usually displaying their animals' figures either by charts displayed above the pens or in the catalogues. Um, but Fiona's going to cover this, but it's still so important to ensure your rams are fit for purpose. The figures are important, but if the animal's not going to work, his genetics are useless. So I can't stress the importance of rams also being fit for purpose. So where to go for more information? We have lots of books and booklets and leaflets produced by AHDB. Um, we've got the new maternal and terminal sire manuals, like the ones um, you can see on the slide, they can be requested from AHDB and split all the traits down um, so you can see an example of how to use it and what it means. You can find all recorded Signet breeds on signetdata.com. Um, technical information is still hosted on signetfbc.co.uk um, and contact Signet. We do, um, for all, we provide a service to for all we provide a service to Signet clients, we also provide a service to the levy payer on how to understand um, how to understand these traits and how to make the best use of EBVs. And also, please ask your RAM breeder. Um, if you can't see figures displayed above the pen, ask the breeder if they have them. If they do have them, great, they can show you. If not, you're asking and it may be something that they then think about in the future. So regardless of whether you can see figures displayed, if you're interested in an animal, please ask if it has figures. Just a bit of a signet update as well. We have the National Terminal Sire Evaluation that is new out this year. So the headline messages are, we have a series of updated EBVs, including weight adjusted traits. And this now means that um, e uh, carcass EBVs are put out on a more commercially relevant basis. So it will tell you what the confirmation, what the fat class of that animal is gonna be at around 40 kilos, rather than based on age as it was previously. We've got new indexes, so all the indexes have been recalculated to account for the way we uh, measure traits now, and all terminal sire breeds in that evaluation now have a maternal index as well. We've rebased the, tra uh, rebased the figures, so what that means is we've set zero back to 2010. We've essentially knocked the same amount of points off everyone, and what it now means is that when you go out shopping for a ram, if you previously went out, went out and said, I just want a ram with an index of over 300, you now need to go and have a look at that benchmark and see where your top 25, top 10, top 5% um, line is because 
rams with an index of 300 may not exist anymore in that breed. Doesn't mean the animals have got worse at all. In fact, they've probably got better. It's just that we've moved zero forward and rebased. We've also got a series of new traits from the CT scanner and monthly blood runs. So you're getting the most up-to-date information available to you every month. The other important change is that Cygnus, Cygnet breeds, so basically anything other than Innovis and the Texel Sheep Society animals are now hosted on our new database and that is cygnetdata.com and it looks like this. Basco now only hosts animals belonging to the Texel Sheep Society. So if you go on there looking for a Hampshire Down or Suffolk, you won't find it. It is purely Texel animals. So that's it from me and I'm going to hand over to Fiona. Thanks, Emma. OK. OK, so I'm going to um, talk about health and breeding soundness um, of rams. And really, when we're looking at um, flock reproductive performance, it's all about ending up with the right number of lambs on the ground at the right time. And that's why we need our tups to be fully fertile. But the ewes are really important as well. In fact, the ewes are more than important. Um, they've got to be sound themselves. They've got to be in the correct body condition score and they've got to be um, well fed, not overfed, but correct body condition score. Um, so, and we know it makes a difference, ovulation in how, um, how they're being fed and different breeds react differently. I'm, I'm not really talking about ewes today, so I'm not going to go into detail. They need to be free from infectious abortion and that does mean they should be appropriately vaccinated if that's appropriate for your system. Um, so, for example, if you buy in use, you are at risk of endozootic abortion, and arguably you ought to buy, you ought to vaccinate um, replacements as they come into the flock each year, um, either endo or, or some people are at risk of toxo as well, and potentially should be vaccinating replacements for that. And we want our use to be cycling before we introduce the rams. But we're really talking about rams today, and my screen is jammed. <laughs> okay, so rams are half the genetics of the flock, um, and as um, Emma has very ably explained through um, performance recording, um, we select our rams for various, whether it's for finishing, whether it's because we're replacing ewes in the flock, um, whether it's because um, on just on site, and, and that's not a bad thing, but we select our rams for all these reasons. But what's most important is that they're producing semen that, that, and they're delivering it to the right place. And that's where our um, checking that the rams are fertile is important. What does it cost per lamb? What does a ram cost per lamb reared? And we can look at the lifespan of each ram and compare it with his purchase cost and actually work out how much he costs in per lamb reared off the farm. So if we've got a rearing percentage of 100, it's actually 143 is um, average percentage of reared lambs. If we assumed one ram for 50 ewes at a rearing percentage of 140%, then a ram that costs 500 pounds that only lasts for one year, it's cost £7.14 per lamb on the ground. Um, and obviously, the longer he survives, the more economic he is. If he's, he's alive for five years, he's only cost £1.43 per lamb. But it's just to demonstrate that actually, whatever we spend on rams, and a lot of people spend considerably more than this amount of money, um, whatever we spend, we need that lamb, that ram to, to last a long time. So how can we dec decrease these costs of the ram? We can expect them to serve more ewes, we could rear more lambs per ewe, or we could buy rams that live for longer. So expecting him to serve more ewes means we've got to ensure that every ram is up for the job. When we've done different studies, um, it's probably fair to say that there are portion of rams out there that are just not working um, and it could easily be 10 even 20 percent now if you're putting a couple of 
rams out to work together, one very fertile ram would, would mask the fact that he's got a mate who's not working. If you're single sire mating, then you know it's it's very um, it's very obvious um, when you don't have any ewes in lamb that your ram is not working suitably. So one thing we can do, um, and that's why we're doing ram and rating ewes, ram fertility testing, is ensure they're up to the job. Obviously, we could rear more lambs per ewe, but that means sorting out other management issues. It means the ewes have to be um, pregnant with a high enough scanning rate in the first place, but far, far more importantly, those lambs must not be dying. So reducing lamb mortality is an important part of rearing more lambs per ewe. And that again is not for this webinar, but it's very, very important. And then the final thing, buying rams that live for longer is actually making sure we're buying rams that are fit for purpose, not something that's been fattened for the sale and looks over conditioned. We don't want to get them home and um, find he melts away or he's not fit enough to to serve the use. So th those are important, but each one of those are areas we must think about if we think our rams are actually costing too much per lamb born. And what are reasonable targets for fertility? We expect rams to get 85% of a group of 60 ewes in lamb in the first cycle. Now, these figures, you know, we can argue about them. These are sort of reasonable um, targets that we, we sort of discuss. And so if, we, if we're not meeting these targets, then, then it indicates potentially we, we could have issues. And we all know that we've got rams who are capable of serving more than 60 ewes, but that's one of the things I would think about when people are putting out lots of ewes if they don't know the ram is up to it that could be a reason um, for for a high either a high empty rate in the ewes or um, just not the lambs the scanning essentially you're expecting um, generally would move, remove rams after four five or six weeks and would would want there to be less than two percent of ewes empty at scanning and quite often will Fine, we're working with flocks that might have five percent, seven, eight, nine percent empty at scanning, and those are issues that we have to um, really consider. And yeah, um, we can argue lambing period. I certainly wouldn't want to go longer than six weeks, and arguably you can go um, quite a bit less than that. And you've got good, um, good for management, good for shepherd um, health to have. Um, a compact lambing period um, as long as you've got sufficient manpower around when lambing is on. So I'm going to go into the MOT and just as you talk through what I look for when I'm checking whether rams are fertile and I would always start with body condition score. Now we absolutely do not want rams that are too fat. We don't want lazy, fat, lazy rams um, particularly we find um, research has shown that a fat ram will deposit more fat ar actually around its testicles and keep the testicles too hot. Um, so, but we can look at body condition score and say how conditioned an animal is. And ideally, I'd want a, a ram to be approximately three, three and a half out of five. Um, so a good covering, but, but you want to definitely be able to feel the spine. You don't want to be reaching your thumbs down looking for the spine because of all the um, fat on the back of the animal. We want him to be in good condition. We don't want we, we need him to be sound. Um, we don't want there to be fleece issues. We don't want him to have a brisket sore. Um, I've gone through a huge number of rams in the last few weeks checking um, fertility and the number of rams who everything else looks fine but they've got still got a separating wound on their brisket from previous years or from a poorly fitting rattle um, that is going to really affect them um, anything that affects his ability to jump on the ewe and feel comfortable is going to stop him wanting to serve them so brisket sores that is something you definitely want to be sorting out um, well before the rams put out 
and just generally sound um, limb soundness, no signs of lameness. I I hate to say it, but I would suggest there are times of the year where 20% of the UK rams are probably lame. You know, the rams get forgotten for such a long period of the year. Ten months are away in some patch of nettles away from the farm, and often um, they're more likely to be lame than even the youth flock. Um, so we really need them not to be lame um, because they really need all four feet to be sound, to be adequately able to keep up with the youth and to serve them well. I would check eyes, teeth, both for age, but also that we haven't got any pockets in the cheek teeth, any um, broken bits, any sore bits. Um, and I'd check their incisors that they, um, they can properly crop grass. I don't want them to be overshot or undershot. I want them to be able to eat well. And then this picture is me feeling around underneath the jaw and below the ears, around the parotid gland and the submandibular lymph nodes. So here, this is actually a picture of a ewe, but she's got lesions of CLA, so that's caseus lymphadenitis. And that's where you get abscesses in these lymph nodes and they burst and heal and burst and heal. We cannot clear this this condition up with antibiotics. Once it's on a farm, it's there. It, it harbours in the soil, in the woodwork. Um, so so um, CLA is something you really want to be watch, watching out for and you definitely want to be looking at it in, in the rams that you buy in. You're far more likely to bring it into a flock on terminal sire rams and it doesn't always actually travel to the ewes. So then we'll start looking at the genitalia. So there's a picture of a scrotum, a very hairy scrotum. Actually, we want the scrotum to keep the testicles cool. I don't really want it to be that woolly because I don't want it to, to um, overheat the sperm. I want to absolutely make sure both testicles are fully descended. Um, uh, if they're too high up in the body, then they're kept too warm and we don't have um, suitable conditions for sperm generation and then sperm storage. Um, I'd be checking the neck of the scrotum, make sure that he hasn't been um, vasectomized. Um, but just checking that everything is freely moving. There's nothing, there's no scar tissue, there's everything. The two, the two testicles should feel like ripe plums um, and be freely moving with inside the sac. The testicle is here in the middle and the epididymis is a little extra bump at the bottom and it goes round the side. So the testicle is where the sperm is made and the epididymis is where it, the sperm is stored. Both, both aspects are very important. They should be symmetrical, this testicle to this testicle, this epididymis to this epididymis. They should be firm and there should be no lumps or bumps. Size is important, not necessarily so much for quality, but definitely for quantity. So um, I would, I always measure at the widest point of the scrotum, um, I use one of these measuring tapes where you can get an even pressure on each one. The, the detail doesn't matter, you can pull a tape measure out of a sewing kit and measure around the widest point and see what figures you're at. And these give you basic minimum, minimum acceptable scrotal circumference within three weeks. So we know the testicles will increase in size as we get towards breeding, um, and I use these as minimums. Now, there are some breeds which have naturally have smaller testicles. And unfortunately, they've probably been bred for smaller testicles. Arguably, we ought to still be using these minimum um, figures. Um, there are some breeds where I would have to reject huge numbers of rams if we always went with these minimums. And I would then I would write on a report testicle size smaller than recommended. Um, and I would not put that ram with so many ewes. And I would not really want to use that ram for breeding more rams because there is an element of heritability in testicular particular size. So if you've always bred for increasing scrotal circumference, testicular size, um, the, you will increase that trait in the breed. If we always accept rams with under the size, you will be, um, you'll be um, increase the chance that the sons and his sons and grandsons will also have smaller testicles. So I would recommend that you do, you are thinking about it, 
it's not hugely heritable, but it is definitely heritable. And as I said before, it's not necessarily quality, but it's definitely quantity, and it will have an effect on numbers of views that the RAM can serve. And then I'd like to sit the RAM up. Um, it's, um, it's quite important that he's sitting very squarely on his haunches, um, especially if you want to extrude the penis, and you have to have him really squarely sat um, to, to pull it out. You can look at his inner thighs, that's a bit of boost weight, but generally this is where you see a sort of purple flush when a ram is really, um, is really fit for, for um, breeding. And then I would once again, I'd check here for the scars for sectomy, and I would check the prefuse, so you often see nasty sores on the prefuse, which can then cause the constriction, flies in the air, so you get ulcers. It's really important that the prefuse is clear and looks fine. And I'd want to check the scrotum. This is a classic example. So if you can imagine this photo, it's not a great photo, but um, the, the legs are here. Oops, sorry. Apologies. Um, this is a scrotum, and these. Um, uh, this is a coreoptic mange. So we've got this thickening and cracking at the base of the scrotum. That's a mite that causes that, and it's something that you definitely want to get sorted out well before breeding because that again you can imagine this swelling on the scrotal skin um, you get a bit of heat um, with that inflammation and that can increase the temperature of the testicles so you definitely want to sort that out um, if you've got scrotal mange you often see it in whole groups of rams together and then this rather grim photo apologies is a it's a penis that's been dissected out but it just shows so i hope no one ever sees it looking like this um, but it does show the gland of the penis and, the, and this vermiform appendage, which um, if we, we, just, we just check that everything looks normal and there are no ulcers. <coughs> um, and I like to see that you can actually fully extrude the penis and it, it will move around fine. Um, those, those are all things that I will check when I'm doing a RAM MOT. You wouldn't necessarily go into quite so much detail, but I would definitely like every farmer to have a good hands on and look at each tub before you decide <clears throat> whether he's fit for breeding. So an MOT, we were, just to summarise, you want to check toes, locomotion, for example here, everything can look fine, but if he's got really bad, um, this, this ram actually had an infected pedal joint, um, he wasn't fit for breeding, even though everything appeared fine, he's not going to stand and further used. Teeth, testicles, the tone, the body condition score, and then treatments. So let me just go, and this should be all done 10 weeks before tupping. So for a lot of people listening, um, you want to be doing it this week. Don't leave it too long. It takes, from when sperm are um, made, they are then stored for six weeks. Um, so the sperm that are made now will not be produced until six, seven weeks time. Um, every ten weeks before tupping, um, so you've got either correct um, situation that's that's not right, an illness or something, or um, or to replace them with a different tup. So check the body condition, make sure they're fed an appropriate diet. It's got to be quite good protein, so that's important for sperm production and the correct mineral balance. So calcium magnesium has to be right in the feed to stop them. Um, uh, bladder stones, urinary stones, um, which is very important in entire ram lambs, particularly. Um, but selenium and zinc levels in the feed are important um, way out for tuppy because we, but we need both, particularly selenium and zinc, sperm motility. But general trace elements need to be right for sperm um, to be produced well. So if you're lacking selenium on the farm, I would supplement with selenium a good 10 weeks before tuppy. His vaccinations to be right. The number of times I've done a post-mortem on an expensive ram, and well, actually the one I can remember, um, it was about 4,000 pounds worth of ram died suddenly. And it was at that stage, as I opened him up and found he died of pulpy kidney, that the farmer realized he'd not been vaccinated. He'd not been given his heptavac or covexin. Um, Rams need to be vaccinated just as much as the rest of the flock 
they need to have the primary course for clostridial um, vaccinations and then a booster every year. Do not forget them. It's very easy to leave the rams out and it's a very expensive mistake when they die from something preventable by vaccination. And often um, foot vax is very helpful in rams to, um, they are quite prone to getting infectious lameness and um, it can be useful to foot vax them. The Clostridium pastorella is essential. Um, if they're at risk of foot rot, then it's worth considering a foot, um, vaccinating against foot vax. And make sure that his parasite treatments are up to date. Um, although we suggest that ewes are not wormed for tupping, I don't have a problem with giving if the rams um, a worm dose and certainly um, a fluke dose um, a good six, um, eight weeks before tupping, um, just to check everything's everything's right with the rams. Um, and I'll just go into so a ram MOT, I've said what I do on a farm. I would expect every every farmer to be doing that for their own rams. Um, so ram MOT is essential for every ram on the farm and it's summarised nicely on this HDB handout. Now a veterinary pre-breeding soundness examination and I get involved doing these on a number of farms and the recommendations from the Sheep Vet Society is it, as a routine, you should be getting a vet to look at your rams, either if you're tapping in single side groups, so the pressure is high, you definitely want to know, have as much information as possible whether that ram's going to work or not, or if you're using a ram with large numbers or synchronised use. Um, so as a routine, in those situations, I would suggest getting a vet to, to look at your ram, um, or if you're investigating infertility. Now, as a vet looks at, you definitely have an MOT, a vet may or may not include a semen sample in that and would um, I'd like to think give a report um, to summarise what they found. Veterinary certification is, is one stage further and some people want that before they sell an animal. Certainly if you're um, making an insurance claim you'd want a veterinary certificate. Then the vet would undertake an MOT they may or may not include a semen sample, I'd suggest they probably would, and they may or may not also ultrasound the testicles. Um, and they would sign a veterinary certificate to say, at this time, that I examine this animal and um, would put their signature to that. So I've talked about semen samples. I don't think we should be semen testing every single ram by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but the Sheep Vet Society, we've spent a bit of time talking with experts and working out what we recommend as best practice. And we would suggest that the semen sample should be collected as a routine if it's an animal tapping uh, large single sire groups, large numbers of ewes or synchronised ewes, or if it's a infertility investigation. The key with taking a semen sample, that must be collected and assessed by a trained person. We can collect using artificial vagina, which is this is where we, we heat the outside. This is a rubber, a bit like a condom with lubrication, and the ram serves into the artificial vagina. That's perfect in a way because it's a, it's a much more natural way to collect a semen sample. It's not always possible. If rams have not been trained, you can spend a long time waiting for a ram to want to jump and serve something looking like this, um, as I expect you can imagine. And that's why we do, we will also use electroejaculation. And you may have seen vets do this. Electroejaculation, and I, and I use it with the RAM compare RAMs to, to check um, semen quality. But I have to say, we don't always get representative samples. We may only get particular fluid. Um, I would not condemn a RAM even with two unsam unsatisfactory samples. It's not proof of infertility. So a good sample, this is a good sample under low power on the microscope. You can see this, um, the, the, it's, it's low power. You, you can imagine these like waves moving around. Um, and that's the sperm as it's swirling around with the movement. Um, and then we look, we go into high power and can actually see um, the confirmation of the different sperm. But as I say, we can take two samples and, and it's not 
and they're not necessarily good and it and it may not mean that that ram is not useful so it's great to get a good sample and that reassures us that the ram's good to work but i don't condemn a ram if everything else is right on just one or two poor um samples from ejaculation so it has to be used with care but but very useful um in certain circumstances so i'll just share with you this is um an example of fertility tests so these are what i would i do for all the ram compare rams i would go through and check identity breed age and then go through systematically the stuff i've talked about and i would just tick the boxes um for teeth feet check his wrist it's okay um so this animal had a sore press piece that we treated um uh, we didn't we didn't tip um, him up so we didn't see the penis. Um, we measured the circumference of the scrotum at 35, and then um, I would note what we get as we collect him on lecture ejaculate. Um, so we'd systematically record this so we've got something to go back to, um, and then we'd say, um, so this ram is fine, his semen samples are all fine, there's nothing to worry about then, but practically I would want to make sure that his prepuce saw has, has healed up nicely. Second ram here, all very good, very nice large scrotal circumference, very good density and swirl, motility, progressive motility of individual sperm, he's okay for breeding. Um, this third one here, he's got, he had some sores in his face but I wasn't worried about CLA because it wasn't his lymph nodes. His testicles looked a bit small which made me a bit concerned although they measured okay um, and I ended up taking two different samples and actually there wasn't it was only 20% recursive motility so in that case I would go on to higher look at sperm at this sort of detail and I would do a tally system and check what's normal what's um, and, and the percentage of different sperms, I'll just do a, a tick box tally system and then check up. And we really want um, more than 70% of the sperm to be completely normal. So for example, this one at the top, round head, long tail is completely normal. This one here has got a proximal droplet. This one here has got a bent tail. Um, so we can just, we, we count 100 sperm and, and say, what's what? with them. And then my final slide is, I just thought if you're buying in rams, it's one thing to check they're fertile and they're all working. You also want to make sure that any ram you buy in does not bring disease back to your own flock. So, um, and I've just used this as an example because for the Ram Compare project, um, we set out best practice quarantine treatments based on SCOPS guidelines. So, we will treat two with two different wormers, either the group four or, or group five, which is the orange or purple Zolvix or Startec. Um, we will inject the um, rams with either Dectamax or Cydectin, looking at resistant worms, but also to deal with scab. And then we actually, for ram compare, give two different liver fluke treatments. I would um, suggest I would definitely give one and it would either be um, a, a, a clostridium or a nitroxinol treatment which I would repeat in six weeks. Um, we, the, the, um, this is a picture of the one so Elanco sponsor Ram Compare with, to which we're very grateful um, but I've, I've mentioned just a couple of different products that are possible so um, but definitely use a trochlosantil or nitroxanil, so that's Trodax or Bukaiva type for resistant liver fluke. And then I would definitely want to check the rams for their feet to make sure they're not bringing either foot rot or CODD onto the farm. And if I was in any doubt at all, I would suggest you get your vet to look and potentially prescribe you an antibiotic to treat um, if there's any chance of foot rot or CODD being brought onto the farm. Either way, anything brought onto the farm, you want to isolate them for three weeks. And I know that's a big ask with rams because a lot of people want to turn them out straight away. But the recommendation is very definitely for six weeks. Um, 
So that's um, all my slides. Uh, Chloe? Thanks very much both. Um, so while I'm waiting for some questions to come up, I'd just like to remind you all that the presentation has been recorded, so it will be available to watch back on the YouTube channels, on the HDB Beef and Lamb channel. Um, we also have some ram testicle tapes for mature rams and ram lambs, which you can order, um, as well as the manuals that Emma and Fiona have kindly highlighted. So the first question for this evening, um, are clins the only breed doing the FEC EBVs, Emma? No, they're not. There's plenty. There's plenty of breeds doing them. So I know the Suffolk's are doing some work as well. Um, but Clins was just the one that came to mind at the time. Thanks, Emma. Um, and how often are the breed benchmarks updated? Once a year. So at the beginning of each season, you need to go and find um, the benchmark for whatever breed it is you're interested in, and you can find them on the Signa FBC website, or you can contact ourselves. Thanks, Emma. Um, Fiona, we've got one for you. There's a lot of rams which are fed on high amounts of concentrates before the sale. Um, how would you suggest transitioning these rams off this diet once you've got them home? Well, that's a very good question. It takes a while. From If you change, change a feed, it takes a good few weeks for the bacteria in the rumen to alter. So uh, I would uh, I would like to have some, whatever feed you was being fed, take some of it home with you. But Porridge is really important. So rams, same as same as every sheep, they're ruminants, and they really you can often help a feed change by making sure the rumen is good, full of good quality fibre. So um, you know, always have nice, good quality hay or leafy silage available um, as a transition. But um, don't don't get him home and think he's far too fat. I'm going to knock some weight off him because that's going to have that's going to be stressful and affect his semen. Actually, I would I would avoid buying a really overconditioned ram in the first place. And um, but you know I know that that, that's, that goes against grain. A lot of um, sales they are well conditioned. You just want to be well aware that um, big is not best. And the more we can encourage people to be either selling direct off farm or um, you know, fed on a diet that they're going to live on as they're working, um, so much the better. Thank you. Um, and are breed society inspections at the sale suitable to accept as a RAM OT or should you always do one yourself at the sale? Well, I would always do one myself and and, and that's, um, people find that em embarrassing because they kind of expect that everything should be there, but the number of times um, People have brought a ram into the vets and said, we don't know what's wrong. And actually, by the time we've knelt down and had them, there is a lot that you can find actually just there by putting, putting your hands on and checking. So I, I would probably um, want to, to check as well. So it's, it's, good, it's good that they're checked and that's definitely one step towards the way. But I wouldn't want to accept an animal at home that I hadn't actually known that I'd, um, you know, looked at myself. Thanks, Fiona. Um, now you've both mentioned the Ram Compare data set. Does this feed into the EBVs? Yes, it does. So any Rams that have been tested on Ram Compare, the figures that you find online as of today, that includes um, the commercial data from their lambs. Thanks, Emma. Um, and roughly how long should we expect a ram to live on average? What should, how long should we expect it to work for? Well, there's no reason why a ram, a, a ram can't work for three, four, five years. Um, if he's, he's looked after well and, you know, he hasn't gone through great fluctuations in being over conditioned and then losing weight or, um, so there's, uh, I would definitely want rams to be um, at least at least three three years and there's absolutely no reason why they can't be longer. Thanks Fiona. Uh, and the final question unless we get any more through, um, what is the difference between the ultrasound and the CT scanning Emma? So ultrasound scanning um, is done on farm on the vast majority if not all um, lambs in a year group and that is purely looking at the loin measurement on the third lumbar vertebra of a lamb. So it's one measurement and it's basically a depth measurement on your lamb chop. 
the um, CT scan is a much more expensive trait to measure. You're looking about £100 a lamb to do that, but it gets a whole body image of the animal. Without killing the animal, it is the best estimation of carcass we can get. So CT is looking at the whole body and ultrasound is just one point on the line. Thanks, Emma. Um, well, that is the end of the questions. Um, you've both been very thorough, so thank you very much for those brilliant presentations. Um, thank you to everybody at home for listening. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be emailed in the next day. Um, so if you, in case you want to recap on anything heard, it will be on there and the Beef and Lamb YouTube channel. Uh, so thanks again and have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.